The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show. On this Tuesday, September 12th, hope everybody's having a fantastic week. Uh, I uh, am a little low energy today, not, not feeling too well, so um, might might lack uh, a little bit on the uh, on the um, excitement scale, but that you know, but we'll be okay um, in uh, in spite of that. All right, I uh, got a bunch of stories to talk about today, uh, and of course, free for you to use the super chat to ask questions. Um, lots of Lots of issues out there, lots of stuff happening in the news. Feel free to ask about that or about anything else that you want to, news-related or, <clears throat> or not. Um, so, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of talk, constantly a lot of talk about um, the dollars collapsing. We, we talked about this before. And then uh, uh, BRICS, they, they're going to establish... Their own currency, and they're going to replace the dollar, and and uh, people are, you know, countries are trading uh, between each other with their own currencies, not with dollars, and and that's the wave of the future. And uh, once in a while, a deal is announced where I don't know China is going to pay Saudi Arabia and yuan for some of the oil that they get, and everybody freaks out, and everybody's convinced, yes, the end of the dollar is nigh. Um, and it, it, you know, it's not that I think the dollar is that great it's it's a fiat currency it's it's controlled manipulated inflated by uh, central planners the challenge is of course that every currency in the world is exactly the same and most of them are controlled manipulated uh, and inflated by people even less reliable than the people running the federal reserve in the united states so it's a matter of uh, the least worse currency not not a matter of a good currency but anyway uh, there was an example of this in the news yesterday. It's it's a story that's been uh, been covered, uh, been really uh, hot over the last few months in the financial world, and that is that um, you know Russia is selling a lot of oil to India. India is is basic basically taking advantage of the situation. Uh, it demands a discount from the Russians on the oil that India that uh, that uh, Russia sells them. So they get it. Uh, they get it, uh, oil cheap on the cheap, uh, and um, and they're willing to buy all the oil that Russia is selling. Indeed, uh, India used to import very little Russian oil, and now I think it's something like seventy-five percent of all the oil imported into India comes from Russia, and it's basically because they're getting a big discount. And because of sanctions, nobody else will buy the oil from Russia. So Russia has to sell it at a discount. And it sells a vast, you know, a huge quantity to India. Anyway, when the sell happens, they can't use dollars. Traditionally, the transaction would happen in dollars, and the money would be transferred from, from India to the United States in dollars over the different networks of uh, money transfer that exists in the world. But given the sanctions that Russia is under... Uh, they cannot use dollars to transfer the money from India to Russia. So how do they get the money, right? So India pays Russia, let's say, with rupees. Russia would like to get rubles, but how is India going to get rubles? India doesn't print rubles. India doesn't have rubles. And the Russians don't buy anything from India, really. Not much, anyway. Small amounts. So India doesn't get an inflow of rubles. So they can't pay for the oil in rubles. Just don't have the rubles. So, and, and they don't want to hold rubles because, God, ruble is so volatile. While they're holding rubles, they could go into the market and buy a bunch of rubles and hold them because the ruble is super volatile. So basically, India is paying Russia for the oil in rupees. Rupees is the Indian currency. 
But then what? The Russia doesn't have a need for rupees. What's it going to do with the rupees? It can buy a few things in India, but generally India doesn't export much to Russia. So the rupees are kind of stuck in the bank. Billions and billions and billions and billions of rupees. Rupees stuck in the bank because they can't be taken back to Russia in the form that's usable, which is the dollar. They can't be turned into rubles, which is the Russian currency. They're stuck in rupees. And you can use the rupees to buy um, Indian government bonds. But who the hell wants to own Indian government bonds? What Russia needs is the currency so it can buy stuff. It, you know, now the next story we'll talk about is North Korea. It, so it can pay North Korea in dollars to give it weapons. And North Korea can use the dollars to buy stuff that it needs to, you know, maybe feed its people and maybe uh, build weapon systems and in, in black markets because, you know, North Korea is completely isolated. Or well, could buy them from the Chinese. So ultimately, it land up in China. But... So the situation right now is that they're stuck. And, and you, yes, uh, you know, Russia could theoretically use the rupees, uh, the rupees to buy gold and then ship the gold to Russia and then sell the gold to the Chinese and then take the yuan and use that to buy stuff. God, that is so cumbersome. And that's why the world uses the dollar as a global currency. It just makes everything so much smoother, so easier. Anybody will take a dollar. You can go anywhere in the world now and, and, and they'll exchange the local currency for a dollar. Not true of a ruble, not true of a yuan, not true of an Israeli shekel, maybe somewhat true of a euro, but that's about it. The euro, the dollar, that's it. So it's a great story just to illustrate just the extent to which uh, the, the world economy is dependent on the dollar, the world economy, uh, you know, all this trade that goes on is dependent on having a, a, a unit of account, one standard unit of account that people can use then as a means of exchange. And that today in the world we have today is a dollar. Now it would be great if it was a dollar backed by gold, it would be great if it was some other private currency that was backed by something. But it's not. So we have an inferior system of money, which is basically backed by the dollar. And that's not going to go away tomorrow. I mean, the problem of the rupee and the rubles and the imbalances of trade, not imbalances, just the, the lack of uh, uh, balance of trade all over the world is, is just a reality and it's never going to change. It's not like there will be a world in which Russia buys as much from um, India as India buys from Russia. You know, not very efficient if you force that to happen so that Russia can then use all the rupees it gets to buy stuff from India. So, um, you know, there you have it. it, it it's uh, Russia now, I think the last time I saw it, last time I saw it was $38 billion. Russia, which desperately needs the money because its economy is struggling, $38 billion of oil that it has sold to um, uh, is, um, is stuck. And this is part of supposedly $147 billion of, uh, you know, Russian money stuck in foreign banks in foreign currencies that they can't find a way to get back to, to Russia so that they can use for what they need. Which reminds me, so I got, I got this really funny, um, uh, let me see if I can find it, really funny uh, a comment on one of the videos um, uh, that I read this morning and I thought, I thought this was, it was really, uh, let's see where I can find this. Um, I, 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 and it relates to this. It was uh, basically somebody saying, 
Look, I, you know, I've learned a lot from Yuan. He inspired me to go read Ayn Rand. I've read all of Ayn Rand's books because of him. But there's one thing, I, it just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, here it is. Yuan Brook was a huge inspiration to me to read all of Ayn Rand's fiction and nonfiction in my youth. I still agree with most of the stuff he says and has opinions on. <laughs> but his relentless pursuit of optimism in the face of an obvious rise of an authoritarian, tyrannical government is getting unbearable. <laughs> anyway, so I'm too optimistic. I'm too optimistic about the dollar. I'm too optimistic about the economy. I'm too optimistic about ability to survive. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm not recognizing how Biden is now a tyrant and how we clearly have an authoritarian state. And any minute now, the government is going to shut down my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm, I'm just too, I, I'm just too positive, too positive about the world. I'm, I'm not willing to be all doom and gloom and people upset about that. People upset about that and I'm losing subscribers, I'm losing followers. Uh, so if you're an optimist like me, good. <laughs> and, and if you like my optimism, then please support the show so that uh, I could keep it going and I don't have to worry about losing some of these pessimists <laughs> over there. I just find it entertaining. Um, I have context. I have perspective. I've been around for a while. I was pessimistic in the 80s. <laughs> I was even pessimistic in the 90s. I, I've, I've waited for the world to end over and over again. I, although I was never really a person. All right, uh, let's see. So uh, yes, we were making, uh, we were, we, we were commenting on uh, on my optimism when YouTube decided it was too much. Actually, when I think the uh, electrical, uh, the uh, my uh, internet provider in Puerto Rico decided it was too much and shut down my internet. Um, it's the gods of pessimism uh, out to get me. All right, um, North Korean summit. So. Um, the brutal dictator of North Korea is uh, on a rare expedition outside of his country. Uh, he is uh, in, uh, he's taking the train to, uh, to Russia, into Russia, Eastern Russia, where he will be meeting Vladimir Putin. The last time uh, uh, the brutal dictator of North Korea, whose name I try not to pronounce because he's not worthy of it. Uh, the last time he, uh, he, uh, he met a, a, a significant world leader, uh, maybe, maybe he's met uh, Xi since, but uh, was, of course, Donald Trump, uh, with, uh, when Donald Trump was uh, groveling before him and calling him his best friend and, and uh, sending love letters across the Pacific. Uh, but he is now... Uh, Meeting Putin, I think he's met his match. I think he's met somebody he can actually deal with. Uh, you know, Trump was too weak to actually uh, deal with. And uh, luckily, Trump was surrounded by people who actually understood the nature of the brutal dictator of North Korea and prevented anything bad, too bad, from happening. But uh, Putin is there, and, and Putin has one specific reason that he wants to meet with um, uh, with uh, the Buddha dictator of North Korea, and that is, weirdly, strangely, nobody ever would have predicted this would ever happen, but he needs his weapons. He needs his weapon factories. He needs shells. He needs rockets. Um, he is running out of ammo, and his factories in Russia can only produce so much, and they're constrained. They're constrained by the fact that Many of the components, the machinery, many of the things that they need in order to produce those weapons, they tend to import from the West, and that is not as easy as it used to be. So it's difficult for them um, to, to, to do the importation. So uh, Putin is about to engage in uh, large-scale purchases from uh, North Korea of, of weapons, and a lot of it is going to be inventory that the North Koreans have. Uh, North Koreans have, have amassed massive quantities of shells for artillery, rockets for launching into South Korea. Uh, they have a, a, a massive army relative to the size of the country. Lots and lots of uh, old Soviet-like artillery uh, guns. 
And that's exactly, you know, so, you know, the Russians are going to get shells for old guns. They're going to get shells for old tanks. Maybe they'll even get some old tanks. Maybe they'll get some T-55s, 54s, maybe 65s. If they're really lucky, they'll get a 65. And um, I don't think the North Koreans are going to accept rupees in exchange. They, they're going to want uh, something they can then use to go and go shopping in China or go shopping somewhere else. So they're going to want real hard currencies. Uh, it, so it'll be interesting. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Russians have plenty of euros because the European Union still buys huge amounts of stuff from Russia, including uranium. Even the United States buys stuff from Russia, like, like uh, uranium, uh, refined uranium. Um, so uh, they have dollars and they have, they have some dollars and they, have, they can use those to buy these North Korean weapons. But, but this is all old. Some of them won't work. But this is just a, a sign, uh, an indication. Again, this is my optimism speaking of, of, of Putin's desperation. And it's also a sign, an indication that maybe the Chinese are not really helping the Russians nowhere near as much as the Russians would like. Because Russia could supply them with modern weapon systems. It could supply them with fresh shells. It could supply them with an industrial base that could actually... Uh, you know, compete with the West's, not in terms of uh, ad how advanced they are, but in terms of how quantities. No, Russia cannot rely on its ally, the Chinese, because the Chinese, I don't think, want to get to a position where they're enmeshed in the conflict in Ukraine. So he turns to, uh, to uh, his good friend, another brutal dictator in North Korea, in order to make this happen. Uh, this is really... Uh, really a sign of humiliation. A any world leader meeting with the brutal dictator of North Korea is humiliating themselves. Uh, Trump humiliated himself and America by going and meeting with him and by treating him the way he did. And Putin is humiliating himself. But what's he got to lose, right? Uh, he, is, he, is a, uh, 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 he is completely desperate. All right, so that's happening any day now, uh, I'm sure the North Koreans will be happy to provide as much weapons as the Russians want. Um, last month, I, th I think it was last month, uh, last month, uh, maybe it was the month before that, um, oops, what, what's going on here? All right, there we go. Um, last month, China uh, dropped off from being the number one um, importer, a, a country from which the United States imports. So the United States uh, had traditionally, uh, China comprised about 20% of all imports into the United States with Chinese companies, over 20%, 22, 23%. I mean, significant numbers, almost a quarter of all the goods and, 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 and stuff that the United States imports it imported from China. As of uh, July, not August, July, China constitutes 14.6%. So it's a, a massive decline worth billions and billions of dollars. And this has started in, in 2018, uh, and, and it's really accelerated since 2021. And uh, we're down to 14.6%. And what has happened is that the number one nation uh, whose businesses are exporting to the United States is now Mexico, which makes a lot of sense. Mexico's right here. It's close. So it's Mexico now, then China, and then Canada, all very close to one another in terms of the percentage that uh, they export, they, that the United States imports from them. Um, Mexico now is uh, is about 15 percent. Uh, China is about 14.6. Canada it looks like it's about 13, 13 point something percent. So uh, uh, you've got a real shift happening in terms of uh, trade, in terms of where the United States is importing the stuff that that we consume. Uh, and uh, and what is happening is is as buyers in the United States shift away from China try to diversify supply chains, try to protect themselves from the potential for a war in, in, uh, with Taiwan, 
uh, a potential for, uh, I don't know, some kind of economic crisis between the United States and China, sanctions, things like that. More and more companies are not moving production to the United States. What they're doing is they're moving production to places like Mexico, to some extent um, Canada, but primarily uh, to uh, Mexico. You're seeing a massive increase in the building of industrial parks, warehouses, uh, all over Mexico, particularly in the north, in, in Baja, but also in Nuevo Leon, which is uh, borders with, with basically Texas, but also in Chuja, you know, I can't pronounce these places. Anyway, in the north of Mexico, also in the central around Mexico City uh, and uh, in, in the state of Mexico, uh, the, the, as compared to the country, and uh, uh, in other parts of western and southern Mexico, uh, basically across Mexico, there is a significant increase in economic activity, in building. Mexico generally is doing shockingly, I mean, really surprisingly, doing really, really well in spite of having a um, corrupt socialist uh, leader as president of Mexico. Uh, Mexico has seen a surge of exports, primarily to the United States. It also has really the strongest currency in the world this year, stronger than the dollar, which is very unusual. Uh, so it has performed better than the dollar. The dollar is weakened as compared to the, uh, uh, the Mexican currency. There is a huge amount of foreign direct investment. Uh, it's up 40% in 2023 versus uh, last year. And that's, that's a consequence, again, of people diversifying supply chains, moving supply chains closer to the United States, becoming less dependent on China. And, and Mexico is a massive beneficiary of this. One could only imagine how well Mexico would be doing economically right now if it didn't have a socialist president, if it had even semi-free market policies, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 as part of its economic policies. Tesla is uh, building a proposed $5 billion factory uh, in uh, Mexico. So not since NAFTA has, uh, has the country attracted uh, so many investors, so much investment uh, into, uh, into Mexico. And, you know, we'll see. Mexico often blows these opportunities. This is a real opportunity for Mexico. Uh, whether it blows it because of horrible economic policies or whether the drug war goes out of control or, or something else, uh, you know, people resist making those investments. This, this could be unique. This is a unique opportunity for the Mexican economy. And the real challenge is, will they take advantage of it? Or will the corruption and the socialism of the authorities in Mexico undermine? Now, uh, it appears that in the election, which I think is happening early next year, uh, the two candidates, the candidate of the ruling party, the more socialist party, uh, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, the former, uh, the, the mayor of, New, of Mexico City. And uh, the opposition party uh, is both are women. So uh, you're going to have a woman president for the first time in Mexican history next year. Uh, clearly, the opposition candidate seems better than, uh, than the uh, ruling party target, but candidate. But if, if this economic boom is a reality and continues, uh, that might be an issue. Uh, you know, the current president, Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador, has repeatedly clashed with business interests, repeatedly clashed, and because, you know, he's a socialist after all, and, and constantly is trying to regulate and control and break up. And, uh, and uh, you know, if Mexico is going to take advantage of this massive amount of investment flowing into the country, it's going to need better, better business practices. Hopefully, the opposition could win, and hopefully that victory will lead to a better, more prosperous uh, Mexico. A more prosperous Mexico is, is great for America. Uh, it, more trade with Mexico is great for America. Uh, more building, more creation in Mexico, fantastic for America. Among many, many things, it, it reduces the pressure on the, on the border. We haven't really had positive net Mexican migration into the United States since uh, 
you know, since the great financial crisis in 2008, Mexicans left America and went back to Mexico during the financial crisis, and very few have come back. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's particularly good for the U.S., but it's, it's good for the, I, I don't know, for, the, for all the craziness at the border, uh, not to have uh, uh, illegal immigrants from Mexico. The reality is for Mexico these days is there are plenty of opportunities, opportunities in Mexico. They don't have to travel north. But they might be, if, if Mexico can actually embrace uh, in, in, uh, policies that lead to an economic boom, then Guatemalans and Venezuelans and others might decide to settle in Mexico because there are job opportunities there. Now, you've also got a law and order problem in Mexico that they're going to have to deal with at some point. Uh, this administration in Mexico has no interest in dealing it. They basically cut deals with the cartels. I, I'm, I don't know if a future administration can do, uh, will and can do any better. All right, Mexico is an investment opportunity. All right, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, another shameful actions by the Biden administration. Uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but it's actually happening uh, as we speak. Uh, the United States has cut a deal with the, with the Iranian regime uh, for, the, for the release of five American citizens who were held in prison in Iran. Uh, as you remember, a few weeks ago, those prisoners were released to house arrest as part of this deal. And it appears that they will be heading to the United States, released from Iran um, any day now, or maybe any moment now, but any day now. Uh, the, release will, uh, the release of those prisoners will trigger the United States releasing five Iranians uh, who are held a prisoner in the United States. Uh, all of those Iranians uh, were held in the United States for violating uh, Iranian sanctions in one way or another, selling them materials, equipment, lab stuff uh, that, uh, in other words, being Iranian spies, uh, who, four of them of the five are U.S. citizens, are dual citizens, the fifth is an Iranian citizen, and they will be sent back to Iran. But in addition... Six billion dollars of Iranian funds, which had been frozen by sanctions and sitting in a South Korean bank, are going have been already released as of this morning, have been released to a bank in Qatar, and uh, the bank in Qatar will be releasing them to the Iranians once the prisoners are released. So Iran will get five prisoners, five of their own people. They'll get six billion dollars. Granted, it's their own money, that, but, but that's been frozen. Instead of that money going to victims of, of the Iranian regime, which is where it should go, it will go back to the regime uh, to fund the variety of hostile programs. Uh, and uh, in exchange, the United States will get five American citizens back. We know what incentives this create. It creates the incentive to, to, to kidnap American citizens. Uh, you know, there are a lot of... Americans of Iranian descent who go back to Iran, I wouldn't go back, but they do go back, and, and uh, any one of them could be a target for basically imprisonment in the future as a, to use as a bargaining chip to release more frozen funds, to release more arrested Iranians or whatever. You don't negotiate with evil. You don't compromise with evil. You don't cut deals with evil. If evil is a threat to you, it must be destroyed. Other than that, leave it alone. But you don't cut deals. If Iranian Americans want to go to Iran, they're taking on a risk. They're taking on a risk. It's their risk. And there's not much that can be done but to undermine American interests by giving the Iranian regime the money to potentially build a nuke, to potentially, you know, you know, uh, 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 build more weapon systems to send to the Russians or build more weapon systems to attack American troops in Syria and Iraq. Nothing good can come of this. But this is exactly the kind of pragmatic deal making that all American administrations have been guilty of for decades now. And the Biden administration is just as bad, if not worse than any of them. Just horrific and uh, sad and, and also suggests that we're probably getting closer to a deal between Iran and the U.S. over its nuclear program 
uh, which is again uh, a, a sham. It, 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 it's, it would be ridiculous, and uh, it would uh, do nothing ultimately other than enrich the people in power in Iran. It will be nothing to actually reduce the risk of uh, of Iranian nuclear prol proliferation. Okay, finally, um, this, I just found this an interesting story. It turns out that over the last, I don't know, six, seven years, there's been a significant increase, a steady and significant increase of attacks against the electric grid infrastructure. Uh, many of these attacks are just people going out there to a, uh, a substation and just shooting it up. That happened in North Carolina a while ago, and electricity was out for, I can't remember, uh, uh, several tens of thousands of people for, for four days. Uh, you know, many of these are uh, committed by, uh, as far as we know, by uh, white supremacist groups and by neo-Nazis. If you go to their um, chats and their websites, there are instructions on how to bring down the grid, how to attack the infrastructure, what to shoot at if you're shooting at something in order to do damage. And they are actively encouraging people to attack the grid. But there's been a, a significant market attack up. Now, there's very little, the data is not super reliable. Uh, whatever, whatever data we have is, um, you know, is partial at best. But last year, there were 200 attacks. This year, in the first quarter, I think, just in the first quarter, three months, there were 62. Uh, just to give you a sense, in 2018, there were eight in the first quarter and, and maybe 60 in the whole year. So in 2023, we've had in the one quarter more attacks than we had in, uh, in all of 2018. And almost all experts believe that this is significantly underreported. Some of the more sophisticated attacks or attempts at attacks are done, uh, are cyber attacks. Some of them are from outside the United States, but most of them are internally in the U.S. It's just, you know, weird that, that this is, in a sense, allowed to happen, uh, that uh, the authorities don't understand this phenomena better and are not out there doing more to stop it. This is more of a sign of cultural deterioration when we have internal groups trying to inflict significant damage on the infrastructure. What's the goal? What's the purpose? Maybe to, I mean, one attack that was thwarted was, was they were trying to bring down the electric grid in Baltimore with the idea that Baltimore being a, a city dominated by a black population, you know, Maybe they expect riots. Maybe the riots will lead to their, you know, their dreamed of race war. What is the purpose? Or is it just to terrorize, just to fear? Or is it just nihilism? Uh, again, hard to tell. It could very well be that some of these attacks are from um, environmental groups, left-wing groups, but the ones where they've actually found the people, they've, they've so far been uh, from these far-right groups, and it's also true that the far-right groups are the ones that are recommending this to their members and giving guidance on how to do it. So I just found this bizarre and, and sad and another indication of the uh, craziness that is inflicting our country. I, I, I don't know what the, you know, and this is me being pessimistic, I guess, but I don't know what the path out of this is. I don't know. We, 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 as I've said, Often over the last few years, the, the far right, the far left, the crazy right, the crazy left are truly crazy. And how you bring the country together, given the gravitational pull of the far left and the far right, I, I, I just don't know. And it's a real challenge. It's a challenge our politicians are not up to. It's a challenge our, politi our politicians uh, have not embraced, don't seem interested in embracing. Uh, there's nobody on the political map today who could pull it off. There's nobody on the political map today that could bring the country together. And I'm not talking about everybody thinking alike and, because one danger is we bring it together under the banner of authoritarianism, which is probably how it all ends. But 
how do we bring the country together around some a shared vision of progress, a shared vision of individual rights, a shared vision of what it means to be an American, uh, even with the disagreements one would expect uh, in the world in which we live. It, it's hard to tell where we're heading, but it, 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 you know, as you see more and more of these data points, it does not look like we're heading in a positive direction. All right, and that's in spite of my uh, 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 optimism. I just, yeah. I mean, people are upset that I don't sit here day in, day out, railing against the Biden administration. That's what they want to hear. They want to. They want me to be just like Ben Shapiro and Biden economy. Biden's economy. Look how awful Biden's economy is. And 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 look at this law. And look at that law. They're fundamentally different. This is the most authoritarian regime in American history. It's just not true. It's incrementally worse as every administration is incrementally worse, and it's not, I believe, as bad as Trump. All right, uh, Silvano says, uh, hey, Ron, here's to catching live. Thank you, that's $50, really, really appreciate that. Rand, also $50. Putin groveling before an animated jelly roll for weapons. I remain optimistic. I'm with you, Iran. Thank you, Rand. Yes, it's pretty pathetic, and it says a lot about the impotency of evil how impotent they really are. And, and all those who support Russia and all those who back Putin, it, this shows how pathetic and ridiculous they really are. But of course, a lot of those people were cheering when Trump met with, uh, with the jelly roll. So, um, so much of our politics and so much of political views today are, are just a, a consequence of unthinking consequence of which tribe you happen to belong to. Daniel, Daniel, this is his first uh, super chat. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, uh, it's a, uh, a $50 one. So thank you. Really, really appreciate the support. Daniel says, um, Canadian government slapped a 300% tariff on sofas produced in China a couple of years ago. That's a national security issue. Can't have those Chinese importing sofas into Canada. They might use them to, I don't know, I don't know, maybe blow up, I don't know. Something bad for Canada. Um, this was even applied on containers that were already en route to Canada. Cronies complained about supply dumping, yes. So the sofas were too cheap. And, uh, you know, Canadian sofa manufacturers or Canadian importers of sofas from Europe or something uh, were... were you know, economically challenged by the cheap sopas from Canada. So 300% 300, 300 tariff. 300% tariff. Four X of prices. It's just, just unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. But that's what cronyism will get you. That's what, uh, you know, this, this idea that... Um, you know, the protecting your local industries as, as a value is is so horrific, right? Uh, so, I mean, there should just be a constitutional ban on tariffs. It's just tariffs are one of the, if not the worst, of the ways in which governments try to manipulate. And one of the reasons they're so bad is because they're so easy to do and so open to cronyism, or so open to manipulation doesn't surprise me the Canadian government is doing this. The American government does it all the time. And of course, the American government and the Canadian government collude which industries we protect in America, which industries we protect in Canada, where we have completely free trade. And, and there's a complete set of in NAFTA of what is Canadian, what is American, and what we can move around. That's why it's not a free trade agreement, even though it does reduce the barriers to trade. It's not a free trade agreement. Both countries would be so much richer if it was a free trade agreement. All right, Remo, um, thoughts on Austrian theory of business cycle? Wow, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big topic uh, that would require a, a, a much lengthier discussion. But uh, my short answer to that is I'm basically in agreement with it, with a caveat that it, it, it continues to need refinement. It continues to need a... a, a uh, 
you know, finance and understanding of finance, which, which I don't think they, uh, many of the Austrians felt that they needed. I think, I, I, I think it's basically true, but needs constantly, constant refinement based on the, the, the new crazy ways in which money can be used, money can be created, what is even money, what constitutes money keeps changing, and, and uh, how that money is filtered through the, the system changes as well, right? It, it, it becomes more and more uh, uh, sophisticated as we go on, and uh, financial, new financial instruments, new financial ways... So I think that the, the, the basic insight is right, and, and the, 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 the Austrian theory of business cycle is true, but it's challenged by the complexity of the modern world to, to, ex, to be able to have real predictive power. And there's a lot of work that I think is being done and needs to be done in order to constantly update it. Again, framework correct, details need updating. All right, we'll do uh, some of these quickly. Only $20 to reach our goal. Do you think the Republican base is too unintellectual to abolish, to absorb rand? Yes. Cultural change will come when the center-left begins realizing she was right. I mean, the reality is that cultural change will happen when we have a dominant number of intellectuals and that people start listening to those intellectuals and start following those intellectuals because those intellectuals are... Uh, they're making predictions that come true. They're insightful. They're entertaining. They're interesting. And, uh, you know, some of the center-left, center-right will be convinced. Some people will just follow because they follow. But you need the intellectual firepower. You need both in terms of quality and also in terms of quantity uh, to be producing and communicating on scale. Michael says, the more I study the history of intellectuals, the more they seem like a wrecking crew dismantling civilization bit by bit. Yeah, but that's because you're only studying the history of current intellectuals. But the reality is that it was intellectuals that built civilization bit by bit, right? So they were the original builders. You, you can't have Western civilization without um, the, uh, the, uh, the intellectuals of the Renaissance and the intellectuals of the Enlightenment. Uh, all built by intellectuals. So don't only credit them with the destruction, credit them with the building as well. Michael says, he who, he who loves his neighbor as himself hates himself and thus his neighbor. Ultimately, yes, he who loves his neighbor as himself has no self-esteem. Uh, Roland says, in support of your unbearable optimism. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Phil, inalienable constitution or arbitrary subjective and easily deletable parliamentary acts, bills, and why simplistically? What are we talking about? I don't know what we're talking about. I, I, I don't know what context this question was asked in, Phil. Um, but what we want, I mean, if you're asking what is the ideal, the ideal isn't an inalienable constitution, but it has to be a good one. It has to be a good constitution. It has to be a constitution whose whose purpose is the, to, to define a system of government dedicated to the protection of individual rights. That is the framework. Other constitutions fall apart. Europe has a constitution. It's a disaster. It won't protect you from statism. It won't protect you from the subjectivist. It won't protect you from acts of parliament because it's empty of content. So just calling something constitution doesn't make it so. What you need is a proper constitution, and a proper constitution is one that embraces the notion that the role of government is the protection of individual rights. And, and everything about the structure of the government, its procedures, and the, specific, and the specific ways in which it functions, and scope in which it functions, is determined by this idea of the protection of rights. Tijikin, um, you should check out OSEBX, Norwegian Stock Market, uh, looking really strong. I'm a technical trader myself, but the fundamentals are looking very good in Norway relative to most other countries. Uh, that's good to hear. I mean, Norway, uh, in spite of what many Americans think, is, is not a socialist country, although it has, uh, it's, a, it's a welfare mixed economy. Uh, but it has 
smart people. It has, although again, I, I think I've mentioned in the past that it has dropping productivity. It has a lot of natural resources, uh, and it has it has a, a core group of entrepreneurs that are quite creative. So it is it is interesting, and it has a relatively right of center government that is not as quite as dedicated to uh, destruction as the left is, and it has a, 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 a high level of objectivist influence. There being a lot of Norwegian objectivists on a per capita basis, one of the highest in the world, if not the highest, but very high. So a lot of objectivist oriented people or influenced, influenced people in Norway for one reason or another. Um, Apollo Zeus, thank you. All right, let's see. Bree, the Putin fans are in the Putin fans are in love with decisiveness. Politicians who do something are always popular. This is why we should point out just how stupid, incompetent politicians are. Yes, it's pragmatism has a strong bias towards action rather than ideas because ideas are meaningless, principles are meaningless. So it's all about action. Uh, James says, why do we negotiate with terrorists? Uh, what do you, from an objectivist point of view, when another country kidnaps your citizens who are not at war with? Well, it, it depends. I mean, m first of all, maybe you should be at war with them if they're kidnapping your citizens. Maybe if you launched a rescue mission and uh, acted decisively, no, you know, no holds back, they wouldn't kidnap your citizens. Uh, but it, it is true also that there are some countries where you just have to tell your citizens not to go to, because if they kidnap in that country, it's on them. But, you know, if somebody can kidnap a plane and fly it into that country. The, uh, the, the U.S. government's job then is to act decisively and unequivocally in defense of its own citizens, not only those who are hijacked, but those who will be hijacked in the future if they don't act decisively. So uh, that is, um, uh, you know, that's what should be done. Make them pay. Make them pay for the violence. And the only way to make them pay for the violence is to inflict greater violence on them in a way that protects your own people. And there are ways to do that. Um, all right. All right, everybody. Thank you. Um, I will see you tonight, I think, unless I feel worse and then I won't. But... Um, expect to show at 8 p.m. tonight. Maybe I'll do it a little earlier if, I, if I'm not if feeling up to waiting until 8 p.m. But tonight there will be a show topic to be determined. I will let you know. Thanks all the super chatters. We did make our target, so really, really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day, and I'll I'll see you tonight. There'll be another you on book show tomorrow, but tomorrow the new show will be at 3 p.m. So it'll be relatively late. I have just a bunch of stuff in the morning, so. 3 p.m. Bye, everybody.